The idea of one's favourite game is always a tricky thing to work out. It could vary depending on the time of day, a chosen platform, or the pangs of nostalgia striking at random opportunities. Sometimes, though, you will discover that one game, one which transcends the waves of nostalgia, one which sticks with you and becomes your absolute favourite of all time. Without a doubt, for me, that is Paradroid. Though not the first C64 game to be developed by Andrew Braybrook, nor the first for its publisher, Houston Consultants, it's certainly the one which put both on the map for fans of the trusty Breadbin. One of the big reasons for this is related to its development being chronicled within the hallowed pages of Zap64. One of the first avenues for eager fans to really get a peek into the game development process, with both its highs and its lows. Paradroid takes place across a series of space freighters travelling to the Beta SETI system. Their cargo, military battle droids. As unsurprising as it may sound, when passing through an uncharted asteroid field, the convoy was bombarded with a beam emitted from one of said asteroids. The results were fatal. All the droids on board have gone rogue, and if the recovered distress beacons are to be believed, things have become very grim for the human crew on board which is where you come in. It's not feasible to send a heavily armed crew to deal with the droids, and so another plan was formed. A remote drone, the influence device has been beamed aboard the first of the freighters, the titular paradroid, and you are its operator. Where most games of its time would have you clear each deck in sequence, Paradroid offers you complete freedom in how you choose to move through. This really plays into a tactical element because each deck contains its own droid population. Some have the low grade droids like garbage and service models. As for others, they're filled with the heavy hitters. Battle droids and security droids, all heavily armed and out for blood. I'm sure the big question you're asking is, how do you identify those differing droid types? Well, that's quite straightforward. Rather than showing the action as a live view of the actual environment, what you're seeing is remote data received from the influence device and its sensors. So instead of seeing each droid as it actually is, each droid is shown as a contact icon, primarily focusing on its three digit model number in the center. This small piece of design works wonders, both technically, but more importantly, tactically. On the technical front, it means that there are far less sprites needed to show droids as they move about the map. From a tactical one, it means that you really only need to worry about the droid model numbers. So when in battle, you could quickly analyze the situation in a much more effective way and see what does and doesn't quite work as well for your current setup. The balance between visual quality and clarity is always a tough one to struggle with in games, but for me the balance is tilted the right way here. Yeah, it can be considered kind of primitive and my first encounters with the game certainly fell down that path, but aesthetically it really serves the gameplay here. And I absolutely love the framing device of operating the influence device from a remote console because it greatly brings the experience of not knowing what lies ahead when you come to doors in the middle of decks. But let's talk about the droid problem. I mean, it is the point of your mission after all. The influence device is armed with a turret mounted set of lasers which are more sufficient to take out low-level cannon fodder droids, but not so much for the higher class ones. What's great about them being turret mounted is that you're able to shoot in a different direction to that in which you're moving. This really comes in handy when you're trying to beat a hasty retreat from some hostile battle droids.
What is more important with the Influence device though, is its main ability. By centering the joystick and holding down the fire button, you enter transfer mode. Bobbing into a hostile droid switches to the transfer sub game, which is the master stroke in Paradroid's design. This was a sequence added late in development. Originally, when you bumped into a droid in transfer mode, you instantly took control of it. But in changing over to this sub game, it really, really mixes up a risk reward kind of strategy. You now have to actually earn that new droid. Your task here is to switch more than half those blocks located in the center of the screen to your color, all within the allotted time limit. Your first task is to pick which side of the circuit you're going to use. Both sides are dynamically generated, and so it's really about evaluating which one gives you more opportunities to set the blocks to your color. Once you've locked in your chosen side, the clock starts, and now you'll be firing pulses into the circuits in order to flip those blocks. Both your droid and the one you're trying to take over have a limited number of pulses to use. These are defined by the droid's class, the first digit in its model code. This, without a doubt, is one of the most important things to consider when planning a transfer. Otherwise, you might find yourself having the odds stacked a little too far against you, risking all of the progress you've made thus far. I love the way the transfer game genuinely introduces a spanner in the works. Situations where you think you've got a deck under control and you just need a new host to refresh your current droid, and suddenly you're in a situation that's unwinnable. But at the same time, the complete opposite happens, and you can find yourself in a situation where you've managed to jump up to a high level droid using just the influence device. And honestly, that creates those moments where you truly feel like you're a master of droid wrangling. While succeeding at the transfer game gives you command of a new droid, you can also enter a stalemate which allows you to retry with a new circuit pattern. But failure, that is a harsh one. If you've entered the transfer sequence in command of a droid already, you will lose both it and the one you're trying to transfer into. So you'll be independently controlling the influence device once again. But if you're trying to do a transfer from the influence device, it's lost and the mission ends. Climbing up the ranks of droids in the game offers many benefits. Alongside greater survivability, there's also the potential for higher powered weapons, at least with the battle and security droids. Firstly, you'll have higher powered lasers. These can be single or dual shot, and they're more powerful versions of what the influence device is armed with. Some of the battle droids are equipped with disruptors, which when triggered, activate a screen clearing effect to take out multiple droids at once. Though of course there are other droids that have resistance to this effect. But taking charge of these more powerful droids does carry a price. The influence device can only maintain control of a droid for a limited amount of time. The higher the class, the shorter the time period, which means survival necessitates you transferring between droids on a regular basis. Failing to do that, or suffering a little too much damage in battle, your previous host droid will explode and you'll be left with nothing more than a weakened influence device. Which means you're gonna to need to find a new host, STAT. Clearing out all droids on a deck completes a level. The lights will shut down and you'll get an extra swipe of bonus points. And it's time to move on to the next deck. This is done by accessing the lift shafts. Move over one, hold down fire, and you'll get a side view of the ship, allowing you to move between any deck connected to this given shaft. Having the freedom to move between any deck is incredibly useful, not only for the sake of general freedom, but also in building up a tactical picture of what is happening. For example, accidentally wander into a deck containing droids which outclass you, it's okay. Dive back in a lift, try for another deck. It also means you don't need to clear out each deck as you proceed through them. 
And this is far more important because if you mess up after a transfer, you could easily go back to an earlier deck and recover some lower class droids. There are also several other features located within each deck. Energizers, which can be used to repair any damage taken in battle at the cost of your points. There's also the alert displays. These may look featureless at first, but it's like a shmup. Taking out droids quickly will raise these to condition yellow and finally condition red. And as these alert levels go up, you'll get more poise for each droid you take out. Finally, the terminals. Like the lifts, holding down fire while standing over one grants access to the ship's computer, which lets you query it for several things. Alongside a summary of the current alert state and which deck you're on. You got views of the current deck and the whole ship. Though it has to be said the former only shows the layout, including the subdecks, alongside your current location. It's not a shortcut to see how many droids are remaining on the current deck, nor does it show their locations. And the side view is essentially the view you see when accessing a lift. The final feature offered by the ship's computer is access to the droid library. Here, you can view detailed records on all the droids. Well, all the droids below your current host's security clearance. Alongside visual design and some notes, you also get details about the weapons and other little bits and pieces. So that's really the core of Paradroid. Sort of how the systems all fit together. When you clear out a ship, you move on to the next one, which is the same layout, just harder. And the base droids on each level get tougher. So the presentation is simplistic, but we are talking 1985 stands. And so compared to its peers, it's actually quite a bit more detailed. You do have a static title screen, but that is really only preparation for the attract sequence, which I love for just how detailed it goes into playing the game. It is surprisingly comprehensive and something I truly wish more games did. Sadly though, the realism of software piracy, at least in that era, was enough to have ideas like that taken out of later games. So you can go buy a copy and read the manual. Funnily enough, it's kind of returned to modern gaming because of the addition of heavily detailed tutorials. So what goes around comes around indeed. One little tidbit I love is the inclusion of both the best score of the day and a worst score of the day. Whilst the score isn't quite an important factor in mastering Paradroid, earning the worst score of the day for a given session can easily make for a quick chuckle. While I talked about the in-game droid sprites being representative as just model numbers, the rest of the visuals fit in quite handy as well. Paradroid is probably the first game on the CCD4 to use the bas-relief styling for the walls and a lot of games picked up on this particularly later on. But I think it fits in really nicely for building out the details of each deck. The iconography you see in the terminal screens is clear and easy to read, and that's an important factor with UI design. Then there's the detailed droid sprites as presented in the droid library. They're great for fueling the imagination of what you're actually seeing on the decks. Ranging the gamut from friendlier service and messenger droids to those utilitarian maintenance droids and culminating in the battle and security classes, they're all a great slice of design and go really well to proving the adage that cute and high tech do not go together. As for the feeling of high tech, it more than comes across via the sound. Sure, there's no cracking title theme, but the droid chatter you hear in your track sequence builds up the attention quite a bit. As you're exploring the decks, the sounds of battle bumps, laser blasts, they're all well constructed as well. And the explosions give you a cracking thrill as you're blasting rogue droids. One of the more interesting tidbits to Paradroid's history is the fact that it has three distinct versions. Whilst you may think that's nothing special in our modern landscape of Game of the Year editions or Day 1 editions, it was certainly something which stood out back then. Firstly, we've got the original 1985 edition. That's primarily what you've been seeing here thus far. A year later, the Competition Edition, or Fast Paradroid as it's known, 
was released in a two-pack alongside Uridium Plus, a version of Uridium featuring new levels. As the tape itself notes, this is simply a fast version of the game, the result of a number of optimizations being applied here and there, resulting in much faster gameplay. It also has an incredibly snazzy tape loader, which has to be one of the most aesthetically pleasing things I've seen as a game loads. Other than that, it plays pretty much the same, just faster. The final variant, Heavy Metal Paradroid, was released on Houston's Racket label in 1988. This edition really grew out of experiments which occurred during the early development of Morpheus, particularly around the switch to a multicolor visual style. So this results in new graphics for the decks, leaving the old bas relief style in the dust, which was kind of fair because at this point, a lot of other C64 games copied the style, and so it was a little impasse. I do enjoy the visual tweaks made here. I think the walls stand out as much stronger elements, and it also carries in the speed optimizations from the competition edition. Personally, I think I stick with the old speed of the original release. I think it's just how I prefer playing it, and it helps that focus on more tactical movement and battling over the more frantic pacing which the updated versions offer. Now, despite what many think, there, there never really is the perfect game, and Paradroid certainly is amongst them with a couple of niggles, and they really focus around what happens when you've cleared out some of the decks. Tracking down the last rogue droid on a deck can be troublesome sometimes, when you factor in patrol paths, deck sizes, and other things can be quite a chore to hunt them down. So the lack of an indicator or a pointer to that last droid's location can be a bit of a bummer. It means that the chase goes on far longer than you need it to go, especially when you're in a position where you really need to replace your host droid. I also wish that when viewing the side view or using the lifts, you also got an indication of which decks you had previously cleared. So when you're trapezing through the ship on a return path, you know what decks you don't need to stop and check into. That might just be an uh, aspect to my own personal strategies when moving through the ship, but I find it sometimes can be easy for me to just lose track of which decks have and haven't been cleared, particularly when you've been so focused on clearing out one of the larger decks that you haven't done a deck change in quite some time. There is of course one elephant in the room which does really need to be talked about, and that is of course Quasitron. Though it did start out as a conversion of Paradroid to the Spectrum, along the way these were mixed up quite a bit to become its own unique game. Whilst I have sat down with Quasitron in the past, that was of course on its own merits and not really on how its core mechanics diverged from those in Paradroid. And the first of these really is with the isometric game view. The move to an isometric style view feels more in line with what other Spectrum games did at the time. It also means the play area loses the free scrolling seen in Paradroid, going for a paged approach which is more in line with the Spectrum's simpler video hardware. The isometric view also means Quasitron's levels are wide open. You don't get any hidden rooms, which also means there's no surprises lying in wait. It also means if a droid is in visual range, then it's shown on screen, as there is no line of sight applied to your view. On the flip side with Paradroid, the overhead environments give you that closing claustrophobic feeling. You may be able to see into a neighboring room, and even when droids in that room open the doors, but unless you've got direct line of sight in there, you won't know what lies beyond the door. It gives you that feeling of the unknown, the tension of what threats lie in wait. The bigger difference though is really on the droid front. Paradroid's droid identification is a straightforward numerical sequence. The higher the number, the more powerful the droid. Quasitron's is somewhat more convoluted. 
Droids are designated with a letter and a number, X8, R5, etc. And initially this looks to be kind of sensible. But as you move further up the droid ladder, it starts to get a little confusing and a little twisted. The result is that you can't simply rely on a quick glance at the screen to know what threats are around you. Instead, you've got to memorize the entire droid catalog or have it written down to be able to plan ahead. And this really imparts tactical planning. This isn't helped by the droid identifiers being visually smaller on screen, meaning recognition takes that extra moment over the model codes in Paradroid. And this is ever so critical when you're failed to transfer or grapple, as Quasitroid likes to call it, or you've been blasted back to your standard droid and need to get yourself back up to fighting strength quickly. This also really ties in with how the transfer or grapple sequence works. Where Paradroid, a successful transfer results in you taking over the droid wholesale. In Quasitron, it's about scavenging parts. So the more blocks you flick over to your color, the more parts are available to take. Now, I like it as a neat idea, but again, you're reliant on having to memorize every upgrade available for these four systems. And make sure you know how they compare to what you're already equipped with as you don't want to find yourself accidentally downgrading a major component or accidentally install an upgrade which draws too much power from your current droid. It feels like the first pass of a lot of these advanced ideas and honestly, I feel that a lot of these concepts got refined that bit further in yet another game. Ranarama. Now again, Ranarama is something I have previously looked at, and whilst it's a fantasy world over the high-tech environments of Paradroid and Quasitron, there are still similar objectives. You progress through a series of dungeons, uncovering rooms, locating warlocks, and defeating them in combat to earn ruins. And the big thing is about how you upgrade your capabilities. Where upgrading in Quasitron is performed by successfully grappling with droids and scavenging their parts, in Ranarama, it's all about casting spells. To cast spells, you need ruins which you earn by defeating warlocks. Those spells are grouped into power spells, offensive spells, defensive spells, and effect spells. Now where this works better for me is that when you go to cast a spell, the game screens offer so much information. You know what level a given spell is and you know how it's improved over the previous levels. You also know what kind of impact it's going to have on your power usage based on the current power spell you've casted. So you can make the choice about risking that spell for a higher offensive level, knowing it's going to impact your power usage. This feeds back into Paradroid, because in Paradroid, when you level up and transfer to a new droid, you know that you're moving up the ladder. Better weapons, greater survivability. You know that you're progressing. The grappling and salvaging of Quasitron doesn't quite work as well in my book, and for Ranarama, the ability to cast your spells independently and at any point greatly offers far more freedom in building your own path. For many games, the thought of tactical gameplay tends to conjure up strategy tiles with micromanagement of various units, all involved in a mass skirmish or engagement. But for me, after all this time, Paradroid is still such a shining example of how tactical approach to design can result in something which is still thrilling, engaging, and most of all, challenging. Even some 33 years after its initial release, it's still a game which draws me back every so often to try and take another run at tackling those decks and clearing those droids out and seeing just how far I can get. There is so much to it that operates on a number of levels that it really remains fresh in my mind and as a shining example of what the 8-bit era was truly capable of. And with that, I'm going to leave it here. This is a bit of a milestone episode as number 300 and I would like to thank everyone who's been uh, enjoying the, the videos over the years, allowing me to do these deep dives, allowing me to, to highlight some you know, beloved and not so beloved gems of the 8-bit era. And here's to many more. 
so thank you all very much for watching.